Hello everyone, Todd Shellnut here with CFI Pro Courses, and this week we're going to take a little bit deeper look into how do you solo someone who's already a pilot. Stay tuned, we're going to find out. Okay folks, our discussion today is going to start over in 14 CFR, Part 61, Section 31. Let's go ahead now and take a look at that, and let's see what we're trying to get to the bottom of. All right, let's take a closer look at 14 CFR, 6131, and we're going to be looking at Delta here, but let's look and see exactly what 6131 is all about. It basically breaks things down into three different categories, and that is, Anything dealing with a type rating, the requirements to avoid type rating. If you're going to do any additional training outside of your normal pilot certificate ratings. And then authorization. So what are you authorized to do? Night vision goggles, category two, category three, uh, ILS approaches, authorizations that you would have on your pilot certificate. But specifically today, we want to talk about how do you solo a pilot who's already a pilot. You want to go ahead and solo them for training. And this is where 6131 Delta comes into play. Let's scroll on down and let's look at Delta. And again, as we, we break stuff out and, and look at things, we're going to see that this is actually broken down into a couple of different parts. And let's just break it down individually. So that way you can be more educated. Let's look at Delta. It says um, aircraft category. This, this relates to aircraft category or a class or a type rating. Uh, and it's based on limitations on operating an aircraft as the pilot in command. So acting or serving as the pilot in the command. And it says to serve or also to act as the pilot in command of an aircraft, a person must hold the appropriate category and if applicable class and if applicable type rating for the aircraft to be flown. Or if you don't hold that, if you're not already hold the, the category, the class, and a type, then you must have, let's go to number two here, have received training by this part. So that's one, that's one thing there. Let's, we're going to look at that here in just a second. Re have received training of this part. And then it says, appropriate to the pilot certificate level, uh, of the aircraft category, class, and type rating for the aircraft to be flown. And then lastly, it says, have received an endorsement for solo flight in that aircraft from an authorized instructor. And that's the last part we're going to talk about. We're going to end up the video talking about that. So let's break this down individually and talk about each one in a scenario that I'll give you. So here's the scenario. I've got a high time rotorcraft pilot. And this rotorcraft pilot comes to me and says, Todd, I'd like to get my uh, private pilot or commercial pilot. It doesn't matter whichever one, but they want to cross over to the airplane category. And I'm going to talk about airplane category because I'm an airplane CFI. I'm not a rotorcraft CFI or a glider CFI. I'm just airplane. So I'm going to go with what I know, but it can be used uh, for, for whichever one you want. It works the same both ways. So the first thing we're going to talk about is this statement right here. So it says, must have the training of the part, and I'll go ahead and add this other part, that is appropriate to the pilot certification level. So if I want to add on uh, to this rotorcraft, commercially rated rotorcraft pilot, and he says, Todd, I want to get a private. Well, I'm going to go to my 100s, right? My 103, 105, 107, 109. Or if he says, Todd, I want to get a commercial pilot certificate, for airplane, single engine land, or multi-engine land, whichever. All right, good. I'm going to go to 120 is my 123, 125, 127, 129, 3579. Easy way to remember that. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just remember that for the private and for the commercial level, and even for ATP, if it ends with a three, it's eligibility. If it ends with a five, it has to do with knowledge, the book work, seven, it is with a seven. That's everything you got to do in the airplane and a little bit more ground. And then nine, all the required flight time. So it says, I must have received the training of this part. So out of three, five, seven, and nine, 
which one deals with the training? Well, it's five. That's everything, the knowledge they must have. And then it's seven. And that's everything they must do additional ground on. And then also everything they must do in the aircraft. In this particular case, we're talking about airplanes. So I have to go and get the uh, the training that is appropriate to the pilot certification level of this part. Now, uh, just as a very brief here, we're not going to get into too much detail on here, but in 61.63, Bravo and Charlie, it's respective to category, an additional category, an additional class, and I simply just follow the directions in that. And it says I must have the training of this part that is appropriate to the uh, each area of operation. So what area of operation are they talking about? Well, they're talking about the sevens, the 107 or the 127. And where can you find area of operations? You can find them in the Airman Certification Standards or in some cases, practical test standards. If you're still talking about that for some of the ratings or certificate level you may be trying to train for. So I have to go to the ACS, I've got to go to the reg, and I've got to see exactly what I need to train on. What is the examiner going to be asking? Uh, how do I train them? So I'm going to go to 10. Uh, let's say, for instance, it's a private. I'll go to 105. That's got a, my ground, and they may already know some of this stuff. Like, do they know airspace? Yeah. Well, if it's a rotorcraft pilot, I may not need to spend a lot of time on airspace. Yeah, but I may need to explain fixed wing aerodynamics. I may need to do a review on some other items. It's all what is required by the area of operation and the airman certification standards or in the respective knowledge area and uh, flight training portion, which is your fives and your sevens of that sequence that I just gave you. So once I've made sure that this person has had the training, uh, I know for a fact that for the private, he's going to have to have so much solo time in the airplane um, and so I've got to prep them to solo. So I'm going to work with them and make sure they're completely ready to solo. And, uh, and it must be for the aircraft uh, that you're going to be flying. So I've got to do it in that airplane. I can't uh, do it, work with them in a single engine and solo them in a multi-engine. Okay, but it says for the aircraft to be flown and have received an endorsement for solo flight in the aircraft of an authorized instructor. Now, before I talk about this endorsement, and why it's given, I need to make sure that we completely have one thing completely squared away in our mind. And that is, in regards to the regulatory guidance, what is a student pilot? And that is, it's a trick question, folks. The reason for is because, uh, really, uh, the FAA does define student pilot, and a student pilot is someone who doesn't have a pilot certificate. However, they also use this term very liberally when they were talking or when they're talking about someone that is training for something. So they'll say, uh, especially in letters of interpretation, they'll say the student pilot. And we may be talking about someone who's actually trying to train for their commercial. Uh, or any any other higher rating. We and they and so the FA likes to use that term and they like to throw it around a little bit. Um, and you see this also like in 6156 for a flight review where it says a student pilot is not applicable for that. And so people will think that if you're outside of your flight review and you're trying to solo an airplane, uh, but you're only a rotorcraft pilot that you actually have to, uh, you can, you know, you can do your, uh, it doesn't apply to student pilots. That's not correct because that's not what it's talking about. So what student pilot is the regs talking about? Well, that's going to be the one that is associated with the 6187, that student pilot. So this subpart C right here, that's the student pilot that is not a pilot and they're training in order to solo. Once a person achieves a, a, at least a recreational or either a sport or higher, you can never call them a student pilot again per se, quote, unquote, student pilot, because this student pilot is for someone who doesn't hold a pilot certificate, okay? And it's very often confused, especially when I say, well, I'm working with my student. 
That's the reason why I don't like the word student. That's the reason why I say the word. Anybody know what I like to say? I like, like to say my client. That way I don't get confused. They pay a lot of money to train. They're not students. They're, they're my client. I like to call them my client. I think it just sounds nice too. Um, so in regards to this area here, once a person has a pilot certificate in hand, you can't ever go back to being a student pilot. All right. Before people start writing stuff in the comment, dissecting everything I say, let me go ahead and tell you the one or two reasons why you would. If you turned in everything, all right, if you gave it all back to the FAA and you said, I don't want any pilot certificates, and then years later or whatever, months later, days later, you say, oh, sure, I want to go back and do it. You got to start from scratch. Yeah, you'd be a student pilot again. Why? Because you don't hold a pilot certificate. So I was correct in what I said the first time, but just know there's some haters out there. It's going to troll the living mess out of me on this stuff. Um, but those are usually the ones that don't know what they're talking about. And I hate to say it like that. I'm not trying to be demeaning, but um, it is what it is. And as you know already, because you're here, regs are sometimes a little bit difficult to to understand and to uh, to interpret. So let's get back to what I'm talking about. Let's go back to the student pilot stuff. So I'm going to go back to my table of contents here. Let's go back to 6131 and let's go back to Delta. And so I, I've i given the training. So now what do I have to do? Well, I go in, it says I have to give them an endorsement. So I'm ready to give them this endorsement for solo flight. But remember, they're not a student pilot. So here's the rub that you have to understand is that this particular regulation only deals with, and you can write this down if you need to, only deals with pilots who are already pilots. They already have a, a green card in their pocket. They have uh, the pilot certificate. They are already a pilot. It only relates to people who are already pilots and it only relates to solo flight. It cannot haul passengers uh, in the story. It's only for solo flight. And that's, that's the end of it. Now here's the catch. And here's where if we're on a check ride and I don't want to be in that check ride anymore, I'm going to ask you some stump the chump questions. So check this one out. If the person's a commercial rotorcraft pilot, they hold a commercial pilot certificate for rotorcraft, and they want to take their private check ride while they're soloing and acting as pilot in command, what limitations and restrictions do they have to abide by? Does anyone know? Well, it would be for the respective pilot certificate level that they're exercising. So if they're going to be exercising the certificate, a uh, pilot, private pilot airplane, then you would have to go to 61, 113, and they would have to abide by all of that. They would not need to abide by 6189, which is limitations for a student pilot, quote, unquote. That's not what they would be. So they would have to limit, they would have to be limited to everything in 61, 113, and they couldn't haul passengers and here's another thing. This endorsement that's located in the advisory circular 6165 for this, and we'll take a look at that here in just a second, just for posterity, it doesn't come with any limitations. You're going to have to doctor this thing up to cover your rear end, which means that you may have to put an expiration date on it because it comes stock out of the, man, out of the advisory circular as is, it doesn't have an expiration. And so once you give a 6131 Delta II, it's literally good forever. Isn't that crazy? You're going to have to put those limitations in there. Let's take a look at the advisory circular and let's see what it says about this endorsement. All right, folks, we're currently in the most current 6165. You know me, I don't like to call out that letter at the end because if this thing goes out of date tomorrow. I don't, I don't want to be saying that's what it is, but of course there's the letter right up there, 6165. But let's look at the Alpha 72 endorsement 
and it's for the 6131 Delta II, and it states to act as pilot in command of an aircraft in solo operations when the pilot does not hold an appropriate category or class rating. And it says, I certify that uh, Joe Pilot has received, actually it's Joe T. Pilot, because you have to put the middle initial, has received the training required by 6131 Delta II to serve as a pilot in command in whatever airplane you're doing it, or whatever aircraft you're doing it in. Um, I have determined that he is prepared to solo that make and model aircraft and then the limitations, which is optional. So it doesn't come with any. You're going to have to put it in there. Okay. So please make sure that you understand this thing does not have, it's a, uh, it doesn't come with anything. It's, it's, uh, you have to figure out what kind of limitations you want them to have in regards to this. Isn't this cool? Now, let me tell you exactly where people would actually issue this and it would be a problem. So someone is trying to take a check ride and uh, let's say, for instance, that there are commercial, uh, or excuse me, that they're private pilot, uh, single engine uh, with the instrument rating and they're trying to add on a commercial multi first. This would be one instance, okay? And so they're trying to add that on there and they would give them a 6131 Delta II uh, to take the check ride. No. Do not do that. You're not required to have a 6131 Delta II to take a check ride. Why? Because your 6139 takes care of every bit of that. So make sure that you understand that you don't need to have that because it's all covered under the prerequisites for the practical test. You don't need any type of solo endorsement to take a check ride um, in regards to that. Okay, just make sure you do understand that. If you're, and just on the caveat here, if you're 6187 um, November or Papa is timed out, they have to have that renewed in order to take a check ride. Otherwise, they, they won't be able to act as pilot in command, and it doesn't matter if they're solo or not. But the 6139, 6139, once you give that to them, that authorizes them to, one, have the examiner in the airplane, and to, two, act as pilot in command of that flight. All right? So, hopefully, we've got a little bit something further down the road, and there's, of course, there may be other situations in which people use a 6131 Delta II, but remember, it only applies if you're already a pilot and if you're going to be the sole manipulator and sole occupant of the aircraft. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Regulation Wednesday and keep sending those comments in and keep sending me ideas for Regulation Wednesday. I love reading them. If you haven't already and you've stayed with me all the way to the end, would you do me a favor and go ahead and subscribe and like this video and send it to a buddy, send it to a pal. I love to be able to get out there and spread the good news of this regulatory guidance that people usually just vomit when they start trying to read it or they just go to sleep. So click that little bell for future notifications. I'm Todd Shellnut for CFI Pro Courses, and I'll see you at the airport maybe one day on a check ride. Take care.